Okay, so good morning, everyone. Today we'll be having part three of our kinematics lecture. So far, we have discussed displacement, velocity, and acceleration in one, two, and three dimensions. Now, in one dimensional kinematics, we have put together these kinematic equations um, for constant acceleration. And we were able to use that in our examples in order to find variables like our initial velocity, final position, final acceleration, um, the angle between the acceleration and velocity vectors, and so on. So we were able to tackle how to get the components of the velocity and acceleration vector. And we also introduced the position vector r in place of just x or y components in one dimension. So in this lecture, we'll play with these equations some more, so be sure to keep that in mind. Now, just remember that these uh, equations that we got, the constant acceleration equations that we got, you can also use this in getting the y-acceleration, I mean, the, the components in the y-axis. So for example, vy will be v naught y plus a y t. So when we tackle projectile motion, you will be handling both the x and y components of the velocity, the acceleration, and so on. So remember that these are key equations that we will be using in this lecture. Okay, so what is a projectile? It's an object that is given an initial velocity that then follows a path determined entirely by the effects of gravitational acceleration and air resistance. So for example, when you're pitching the ball in baseball, shooting bullets from a gun, and even if you jump from the ledge of a pool, you are still giving yourself an initial velocity. So doing a cannonball also makes you, makes you yourself a projectile. And also another thing to add to our list of vocabulary words is the word trajectory. So this is the path that the projectile follows. Also, the second bullet here states that we also begin by neglecting res air resistance and the curvature and rotation of the Earth. So why are we doing this? We are setting an idealized model. So when we talk about projectiles as particles, we will assume that the acceleration due to gravity will be a constant 9.8 meters per second squared. And ignoring the effects of air resistance like wind and pressure and other environmental factors that can affect the motion of the particle. But remember that in real life calculations, you must never ignore air resistance. So for example, if you're a skydiver or you're in the military and you're calculating the flight of long range missiles, you will need to consider the air resistance and the curvature of the Earth. The equations we will tackle today will no longer be applicable for that. But I think we will be discussing that also in, in Newton's laws, there are um, times and that we will be assuming or we will not be neglecting air resistance. Okay, so take note that the projectile motion is always confined to a vertical plane determined by the direction of the initial velocity. So as you can see from the image, at any time, the yellow and red balls have different x coordinates and x velocities, but they have the same y coordinate, y velocity, and y acceleration. So take note also that the horizontal motion of the yellow ball has no effect on its vertical motion. So this is because the acceleration due to gravity is purely vertical. So gravity doesn't accelerate the projectile sideways. So this way, as in our discussion in Newton's laws, since they are independent of each other, we can analyze the projectile motion in x and y coordinates separately. So looking at it now, we can then say that we can analyze projectile motion as a combination of horizontal motion with constant velocity and vertical motion with constant acceleration. Hence, the x component of the acceleration will be zero and the y component of the acceleration will be equal to negative g. So ax equals zero, ay equals negative g. Remember that from free fall, 
that the acceleration is negative. So that applies here too. So let's go back to the kinematic equations of motion. We have uh, for constant acceleration and substitute the x and y components of acceleration. For the motion along the x-axis, 2.8 will reduce to vx equals v naught x, and 2.12 becomes x equals x naught plus v naught xt, while in the motion along the y-axis, 2.8 becomes vy equals v naught y minus gt, and 2.12 becomes y equals y naught plus v naught yt minus one half gt squared. So I've shown here a, uh, how we derive these equations and they're not um, that uh, difficult to follow. So I'll move on to the next uh, slide. So in the image on the upper right, All right, so now let's look at this image. So it shows the trajectory of the projectile that starts or passes through the origin at time t equals zero. So along with its position, velocity, and velocity components at equal time intervals. The velocity v, the x velocity vx would be constant, and the y velocity vy would change at amounts in equal times because the acceleration is constant. So it will be as if the projectile was launched vertically with the same initial y velocity. So if air resistance is negligible, the trajectory of a projectile is just a combination of the horizontal motion with constant velocity and vertical motion with constant acceleration. So we'll understand that further once we do our calculations. What does that mean? But um, basically, it's just saying that you can um, get the equation of motion or you can get the the variables at hand when you when you add up the x and y components All right so in the image on the upper right you can see that the initial velocity vector v naught can be represented by its magnitude v naught, which is just the initial speed and its angle alpha naught with respect to the positive axis. So your components of v naught x and v naught y of the initial velocity becomes v naught x equals v naught cosine alpha naught and v naught y is equal to v naught sine alpha naught. Substituting them to equations one to four, so I've lab labeled the equations here, one to four. So we got from the, um, uh, so we are taking the initial position at t equals zero as the origin. So this means that your initial x and y position will be equal to zero as well. So imagine at this moment, if someone is throwing a ball, this is the position at the instant the ball leaves the hand of the person who throws it, or the position of the bullet at the instant it leaves the gun barrel. So now we will let x naught equals y naught equals zero, because your initial um, position will be zero. So there are a lot of things you can uh, now get using these equations. So for example, to determine the shape of the trajectory in terms of x and y, we will just need to eliminate the time variable. So let's use equation two and four to do just that. We will isolate t from equation two. So t is equal to x naught over v naught cosine alpha naught. Then we substitute t to equation four. And remember that sine, um, sine theta over cosine theta is just equal to tan theta from trigonometry. So our equation becomes y equals tangent alpha alpha naught x minus one half g over v naught squared cosine squared alpha naught o times x squared. It may, it may look so complicated, but it is actually just the equation of the parabola. So the general equation is y equals bx minus cx squared, where the constant b is tan alpha naught and constant c is g over 2v naught squared, uh, two, g over 2v naught squared cosine squared alpha naught. 
So in this simple model of projectile motion, the trajectory of the, the particle will always be a parabola. So how do we compare the trajectory of a particle with air resistance and with no air resistance? Well, because the, the air resistance will change the particle's velocity, its acceleration will also not be constant. In the image on the right, it shows a simulation of the trajectory of a baseball uh, without air resistance and with air resistance proportional to the square of the baseball speed. So as you can see, the air resistance had a very large effect. The projectile did not travel as far or as high and the trajectory is no longer a parabola, okay? So again, it gets more complicated when you add um, air resistance, but we'll get to that in the future. Okay, so let's have some, because we didn't have examples in the first kinematics lecture. So I have here an example of free fall and it's about a freely falling coin. So a one euro coin is dropped from the leaning tower of Pisa and falls freely from rest. What are its position and velocity after one, two, and three seconds? We must ignore the air resistance. So remember our kinematic equations here, we will be using one of these equations, I think specifically this equation, in order to solve our problem, okay? So, okay, going back here, okay, so we use that second equation that we saw a while ago, 2.12, I think is the name. Okay, so because it's dropped from, um, from the top of the leaning tower of Pisa, you know that the, the y position will, the initial y position will be zero, hence y not equals zero. And you also know that it doesn't have velocity yet or speed yet since it's, it's starting from rest. So your initial speed or initial magnitude of the velocity will be equal to zero. However, you know that the acceleration will be a constant gravitational acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared. So that's why we have it here. And it's going downwards. That's why it's negative G. So, so remember that the gravitational acceleration in our computations will always be negative in direction. Okay, so, all right, substituting these, so y not will be zero, v not y will be zero. So these two components are already zero. And then ay becomes negative g. And then substituting 9.8 there, we get uh, this working equation, y is equal to negative 4.9 meters per second squared times the time squared. And then after that, we also use this first equation here, Vx equals V naught X plus AXT. And so that's how we got negative 9.8 meters per second squared times the time T. And then after that, you just need to substitute the time. So we have one, two, and three, and that's how we got these values here. So you can try them yourselves to see if you will get the same answer. Next is up and down motion in free fall. So you throw a ball vertically upward from the roof of a tall building. The ball leaves your hand at a point even with the roof railing with an upward speed of 15 meters per second. The ball is then in free fall. We ignore air resistance. On its way back down, it just misses the railing. Find A, the ball's position and velocity one second and four seconds after leaving your hand, and B, the, ball velo the ball's velocity when it's five meters above the railing, and uh, C, the maximum height it reached, and D, the ball's acceleration when it is at its maximum height. Okay, so for A, we will just be using the same thing as, or the same method that we did a while ago. We use the same equations, only this time your y naught is still equal to zero, but you do have an initial speed or initial magnitude of velocity of 15 meters per second. So you substitute that to your equation here, and then you also substitute 
negative g here. You don't need to, this will not be zero. So again, um, you're left with vy equals 15 meters per second plus negative 9.8 meters per second squared times time. And then we substitute the time, okay? So just try to solve this on your own. And then the next problem, the ball's velocity when it is five meters above the railing, okay? So you're given a y, so you will be looking for the vy. So we will be using yet another equation. I think this is the third equation in the, the list of equations that we had on the first page. And uh, okay, so because you're, you already know the gra uh, gravitational acceleration is constant, so you have that. You also know your initial position is zero, so you have that. And then this is your final position here, y. So that's why you can use this equation, because you also have your initial uh, speed or velocity. That's why it's important to also take a look at the given, because you, you already have your initial velocity, your initial, your initial position. So all of these will be applicable in the next um, questions in the problem. So at y equals 5 meters, so you will just substitute 5 here. And so that's how you get this equation. I mean, sorry, this answer rather. So there it's plus minus because at um at the at this time. Because at this time, um five meters above the railing. So the velocity is the same when it's also going down. So that's why there's a plus minus. So the plus is when it's going upward. The minus is when it's going downward in that same position. So remember this image that we had here. So remember this, okay? So that's what happens, you know, like the, at that same line here, they are both going at 11.3 meters per second. Okay, so next question is maximum height reached. Okay, so remember that when you, when you throw a ball upwards, the the initial velocity you will have an initial velocity but your final velocity will be zero because it's like it it starts it's like you're you're dropping it from that height again so it will have like an initial or it will be at rest up there once you throw it because it will be um shooting back down okay so in this case, you know that you have your initial velocity v0 equals uh, 15 meters per second. You also have your initial position y0 equals to zero. You also have your vy um, equals to zero because you know that when it reaches the top, it, it goes to rest. And then you also know your, you also know your gravitational acceleration, which is always negative g when uh, resistance, uh, sorry, air resistance is uh, neglected. And then, okay, so substituting that to the same equation here, zero is equal to V naught Y squared plus two times negative G times Y one minus zero. So to get the, to get the Y at that point, you just need to, uh, okay, uh, you need to isolate Y so I label it as y1 here. So v not y squared over 2g, which is just 15.0 meters per second squared uh, over, uh, times 2, 2 times 9.8 meters per second squared. Sorry, divided by 2, um, 2 times 9.8 meters per second squared. And that's how you get um, posi uh, pl positive 11.5 meters. So that's the height, um, the maximum height that the ball reached. Let me just plug my yeah. Okay. 
So the last question is the ball's acceleration when it is at its maximum height. So you always know that the because we're neglecting air resistance, the acceleration due to gravity will always be the same. Next question. What time after being released has the ball in example 2.7 fallen five meters below the roof railing? Okay, so this one is uh, quite um, difficult. I mean, than the, the others, because the others, you just substitute them. This time, we will need to take it in its quadratic form, because we will be using the quadratic formula to find the roots of the, the equation. So, so, all right. So, because it's five meters below the roof railing, so this means it's already dropping. So, this means that your position is already in the negative side. So that's why your y here is negative five, but your y naught is still zero. Your v naught y is still the same, plus, it, uh, plus five, uh, 15 meters per second. Okay, so we will be using the second, um, the 2.12 equation. So that's this equation. And remember the quadratic equation can be written as ax squared plus bx plus c. So we can take a to be one half g, and then v uh, v not y will be your b, and then your c will be y minus y not. So why is it not negative? Because I rearranged this equation so to to make it look like the quadratic equation form. So right. So this will be so. So that's why. Uh, your one half g here is positive, and then your b here is negative v not y, and your c is y minus y not. So I just tried to make it look more clear that it's the the quadratic form formula equation. Okay, so the quadratic formula, as you have memorized probably in high school, is just negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus four ac over two a, and then substitute the a b c's. And we get this working equation of v naught y plus minus square root of v naught y squared minus 2g times uh, y minus y naught over g. Substituting our values here, we already have our y naught equals 0, v naught y equals 15 meters per second, g is always 9.8 meters per second squared, y is equal to negative 5 meters. And then, all right. Okay, so remember, why is it not negative here? And that's because um, we have already taken into consideration its direction in the initial equation. So when you substitute it, it's just the constant now. It's not the, the acceleration that we're, acceleration due to gravity that we're talking about. It's just g as the constant 9.8 meters per second squared. So don't be confused about that. And then, um, Getting the roots, you have two answers, right? There's the positive and the negative one. So 3 point, uh, 36 seconds and negative 0.3 seconds. But you're talking about time. So you can't really take negative 0.3 seconds because that means it's in the past and we don't have time travel yet. And we can't really have flux capacitors to put in a DeLorean and travel back in time, okay? So your answer here, of course, evaluating our answers, we know that the answer is 3.36 seconds. Okay, in two dimensions now, so a motorcycle stunt rider rides off the edge of a cliff. Just at the edge, his velocity is horizontal with magnitude nine meters per second. Find the motorcycle's position, distance, uh, position, distance from the edge of the cliff, and the velocity 0.5 seconds after it leaves the edge of the cliff. And we will be, again, ignoring the air resistance. So we have our initial velocity already of 9 meters per second in the x direction. So we have our v naught x because it says the velocity is horizontal. So 9.0 meters per second. We also have the time. So velocity 0.5 seconds after. So your initial time is 0.5 seconds. 
And then we will be using the equation that we got here in our 42.8 because remember in the x uh, x axis the acceleration uh, in the x component is zero so that's why v x is equal to v not x did i over yeah i over did it. okay <laughs> so that's how you get this equation and then also going back to what we got a while ago this is the equation and you just plug in the values. So y is equal to negative 1.2 meters. And then your vx again is equal to v naught x. Oh, sorry, this is the third equation, I think. Third equation and then the fourth equation. Something like that, just go back to the slides. And then, yeah. The same thing happens here, substitute all the equations, and that's how you get that. And then after that, so you have your, your x and y components of the velocity. You just plug it in, you get their, um, the magnitude, which is just the speed. So yeah, so you, you just get your magnitude and direction. And of course, using arctan vy over vx, and this is your direction, okay? So you already have Yeah, so you already have your magnitude and direction. Right? So that's how you you answer this because you already have your position, your distance, and your velocity 0.5 seconds after. So just remember those equations that we've solved a while ago. Next is the height and range of a projectile. So a battery hits a baseball so that it leaves the bat at speed V naught equals 37 meters per second at an, at an angle alpha naught equals 53.1. Find the position of the ball and its velocity at T equals two seconds. B, find the time when the ball reaches the highest point of its flight and its height h at this time. C, find the horizontal range r, that is the horizontal distance from the starting point to where the ball hits the ground and the ball's velocity just before it hits. Okay, so first let's find v, v y, uh, uh, sorry, let, first let's find v x, uh, v y, x, and y at t equals two seconds. So remember the, the, the equations that we got where we can put the components of the velocity in terms of in terms of its uh, in terms of sine and cosine. So the initial velocity and initial velocity components. So V naught X can be um, can be solved by getting V naught cosine alpha naught. And the initial velocity in the y component can be uh, can be solved by getting v naught sine alpha naught, and then from our equations, x is equal to v naught x t, and then also y is equal to v naught y t minus one half t t squared, and then also this equation is the same v y is equal to v naught y minus g t. And then in order to get the, ah, yeah, okay. So we're already given alpha naught 53.1. So that's how we got that. And then when did we use alpha? Anyway, going back. Um, all right, so that's how you get that. So everything for A, everything is given already. You already have your equations. V naught is given. The T is given. The alpha is given. So you can easily solve um, A. For B, it might be a bit more um, complex. Find the time when the ball reaches the highest point of its flight and its height T at this time. All right, so here you just use another equation that we had there. Um, 
So again, everything that we're solving here revolves around the equations that we presented in the first one. So your So your y here, your this y becomes h for height. That's why it's in h. Okay, so you will just need to plug in the values, and that's how you get um, h equals forty four point seven meters. Next is find the horizontal range r which is the horizontal distance from the starting point to where the ball hits the ground and the ball's velocity just before it hits. Okay, this time we will be needing again to formulate it in terms of the quadratic equation. So we have um, A is equal to one half G, B equals negative V naught Y is equal to Y. And then you have your quadratic formula, t is equal to negative b plus minus square root of t squared minus 4 ac over 2a. And then, um, okay, so, and then we get the roots. So the roots are, uh, one is equal to zero, and the other one is equal to 2v naught y over g. Okay, so after that, all right, so how did we get this? Because y is zero, see, find t2 when y is zero. So y is zero, so it will become v not y plus minus v not y, and that's how you get this. And then substituting v not y, so we already have your v not y here, and that's how you get this time when y equals zero. Now for the horizontal range r, you will just, this is basically just x equals v naught x t2. So we just named it r, but it's the same equation. So 22 meters per second times 6.4 seconds is equal to 134 meters. Now for the ver vertical component of the velocity, we use the same equations as this equation, and then put different um, different time and but the yeah different time okay so the same 29.6 meters per second 9.8 meters per second 6.4 seconds and that's how you get this All right this one the alpha Alpha is already given. Okay. It's negative, um, sorry. Oh, it moved so far. Negative 53.1 because it's over here. So this was your A naught, and it's already here. So same um since it's parabolic, same um, it's the same direction here, only it's in the opposite direction. Okay. How many more? Okay. Last two. Last two problems. So I hope this is clear. If you need a bit more explanation, um, kindly consult with me. Okay. So next, um, height and range of a projectile. So find the maximum height and horizontal range R of a projectile launch with, launched with speed V0 at the initial angle A not between zero and 90 degrees. For a given V naught, find the value of A naught, find what value of A naught gives maximum height and what value gives maximum horizontal range. Okay, so for this one, so remember when you have projectile motion problems, maximum height H and horizontal range R, that just means the maximum X and Y. Okay, so you can use um, the same equations from before. So we again have our to find our initial to find our initial velocity or speed at x and y. We have v naught cosine alpha naught and v naught sine alpha naught. And then
Okay, so and then we also know at Vy equals zero, um, the time is just equal to V sine alpha over G. This is the same equation as x, uh, x equals V naught x times T minus one half, uh, sorry, Y, Y equals Y naught, um, yeah, wait, sorry, Y equals Y naught T minus one half GT squared. So that's, that's this equation. And then just simplifying that equation, you get this. And then to get T2, to get T2 is the same thing as this equation. So you do the same, uh, same method. And that's how you get 2V0 sine alpha because you're just substituting the V0 Y. And then for, the, for this equation, this is basically just X equals x equals v naught x t2. So this one, um, x equals v naught x t, this equation, okay? So that's how you get v naught squared sine squared alpha naught over g. Okay, so you know that your What's your option? Green zero and so you know that your maximum your maximum height will give you 90 degrees angle, right? So in order to get the the maximum height here, you just need to put 90 also here 90 but it's but but it's two alpha naught okay so that means you'll be using 45 next last problem so different initial and final height so you throw a ball from your window eight meters above the ground when the ball leaves your hand, it is moving 10 meters per second at an angle of two below the horizontal. How far horizontally from your window will the ball hit the ground and you will be ignoring air resistance? So this is just a rearranged um, version of y equals, uh, y equals y naught t minus one half gt squared. So we did the same thing. We got the a the ABC components of this quadratic equation, use the quadratic formula, plugged in the values, and this is how we get the time. Okay, so now let's move on to motion in a circle. So when a particle moves along a curved path, the direction of its velocity changes. So we discussed this in our previous kinematic lecture. Um, this means that the particle must have a component of acceleration perpendicular to the path, even if the speed remains constant. So we will now be talking about an important special case of motion in a circle. So when you say uniform circular motion, it means that the particle is moving in a circle with constant speed. So in the image here, we have a car rounding a curve with constant radius at constant speed. So this means that there is no component of acceleration parallel or tangent to the path. Because if it did, then the speed will no longer be constant. So the acceleration vector is in the direction of what you would call normal to the path or it is perpendicular to the path. So this is why the acceleration is always directed inward toward the center of the circular path and never outward because it's always toward the center, the direction of the velocity changes while retaining its speed. So this is normal. Now, 
what if the car is speeding up or slowing down? So a car speeding up or slowing down uh, means that the acceleration vector will be above the normal or below the normal. So this means that in both cases, there will be a parallel component apart from the perpendicular component as in the uniform motion. And because it now has a parallel or tangent component, the direction of the velocity and the speed will change as well. Okay. So how do we find a simple expression for the magnitude of the acceleration in uniform circular motion? So let's look at uh, figure A on the right. So it shows a particle moving with constant speed in a circular path of radius r with the center at zero. This, oh, sorry, at O, not zero. This particle moves a distance delta s from P1 to P2 in a time interval delta t. So the image B now shows the vector change in velocity delta v during this interval. So the angle labeled as delta phi are the same because vector v1 is perpendicular to the line op1 and vector 2 is perpendicular to the line op2. So this means that the triangles in both images are similar. So we can then see that the ratios of the corresponding sides of t, uh, of, of t similar triangles are equal. So the magnitude of the change in velocity delta v over the magnitude of the initial velocity will be equal to the change in s over the radius r, this equation. Rearranging that equation to isolate the magnitude of the change in velocity, it is now equal to the magnitude of the initial velocity over the radius multiplied by delta s. The magnitude um, a av of the uh, average acceleration during delta t, we have um, a av equals the magnitude of the change in velocity over the change in time is equal to the magnitude of the initial velocity over the radius times the change in s over change in t. So the magnitude now of the instantaneous acceleration a at point p1, as we have mentioned before, would just be the limit of the average acceleration as we take P2 closer and closer to P1. So if the time interval delta t is short, delta s is the distance the particle moves along its curved path. So this means that the limit of delta s over delta t is just the speed v1 at point 1. Also, P1 can be any point on the path. So we can drop the sub subscript and let v represent the speed at any point. Now we have this new equation which is what you call the radial acceleration, which is equal to v squared over r. So to summarize all this, in uniform motion, the magnitude a rad of the instantaneous acceleration is equal to the square of the speed v divided by the radius r of the circle. Its, its direction is perpendicular to the velocity and inward along the radius. So another term for this radial acceleration is the famous centripetal acceleration. And this is because the acceleration in uniform circular motion is always directed toward the center of the circle. So where the centripetal um, word means seeking the center in Greek. So you can try an experiment. You can have a clear glass of water and fill it halfway through. If you spin it fast enough um, in, a, in, a, in a circular motion, if you spin it um, above, it will, um, it will, the, the water will not spill out if you do that. So you can, you can try that simple experiment um, if you want to. I'll, I'll also send a link about it or I'll put it in the description. So another way to express the magnitude of the acceleration in uniform circular motion is in terms of the period T of the motion. So the time for one revolution or one complete trip around the circle in a time T, the particle travels a distance equal to the circumference 2 pi r of the circle. So its speed becomes V equals 2 pi r over T. Substituting this to our equation earlier, the centripetal acceleration can now also be equal to 4 pi squared r over 
teaspoon. Okay, so now we have this um, two-dimensional example for centripetal acceleration. So an Aston Martin V12 Vantage sports car has a lateral acceleration of 0.7 g equals 0.97 times 9.8 meters per second squared is equal to 9.5 meters per second squared. So that's your radial acceler acceleration. This is the maximum centripetal acceleration the car can sustain without skidding out of a curved path. If the car is traveling at a constant 40 meters per second on level ground, what is the radius R of the tightest unbanked curve it can negotiate? Okay, so easy. You can just rearrange the equation a while ago. A uh, radial acceleration is equal to V squared over R, and that's how you get 170 meters. Next problem, uh, passengers on a carnival ride move at a constant speed and horizontal rate circle of radius five, me making a complete circle in four seconds. What is their acceleration? So you, have, you can have two solutions here. First, you can just plug in everything. So you have your five meter radius, you have your time in seconds. So the answer here is 1.3. Um, 1.3 times gravity or 12 meters per second squared. And then next one is another way is to first get the velocity to pi r over t, which is just 7.9 meters per second squared. And then you can use the original equation, um, uh, radial acceleration is equal to v squared over r. So that's Still the same answer, 12 meters per second squared. Okay. Now, what about non-uniform circular motion? It's when the speed is varied. So we already saw images of the car a while ago, um, these two images. So the equation from earlier will still give the radial component of the acceleration. So radial acceleration is equal to v squared over r which will always be perpendicular to the instantaneous velocity and directed towards the center of the circle. But since the speed now has different values at different points in the motion, the value of the radial acceleration is not constant. The radial or centripetal acceleration is greatest at the point in the circle where the speed is greatest. So for non-uniform circular motion, there is also a component of acceleration that is parallel to the instantaneous velocity. And this is what you will be calling your tangential acceleration or tan, a tan. This is equal to the rate of the change of the speed. So remember that the tangential component is in the same direction as the velocity if the particle is speeding up and opposite in direction if the particle is slowing down. So when the particle speed is constant, then a tan is equal to zero. And that's why you have your uniform circular motion you only have your radial acceleration component, okay? This is kind of like the, the parallel and perpendicular components of um, the acceleration in the previous, um, previous video, if you can remember, okay? So, okay, to our last topic, it's the relative velocity. So imagine a first scenario, you're inside a train and you look out the window and you see a car and the car starts to move, but the train is still stationary as it gathers passengers. So as the observer, you see that the car is moving forward, but to the driver of the car, it would seem as though the train is the one moving backwards. So after the train closes its doors and you start moving and accelerates, you pass by the car again. Only this time, the car, uh, it seems to, the car seems to be moving backwards and the driver, driver of the car would seem as though the train is moving forward. So why is that? Well, when two observers measure the velocity of the same object, they get different results if one observer is moving relative to the other. So the velocity seen by a particular observer is called the velocity relative to that observer, or just the relative velocity. So in the image on the right, you can see air show pilots, and they have complicated problems involving relative velocities. So they have to keep track of their motion relative to the air and relative to each other and relative to their audience. And this is because they have to maintain enough airflow over the wings to sustain lift 
to keep tight formation without colliding with one another and to remain in view of the audiences watching them. So in those circumstances, circumstances rather, knowing the relative velocity is extre extremely important. So let's talk about it first in one dimension. If a passenger walks with the velocity of one meters per second along the aisle of the train, moving with velocity three meters, meters per second, what is that passenger's velocity? Well, if you look at it through the second passenger's eyes sitting in the train, she's moving at one meters per second. But a person on a bicycle standing beside the train uh, see the walking passenger moving at four meters per second. Then an observer on a train going in the opposite direction would give you also a, a third answer. So with that, we have to be specific about which observer and the velocity relative to that observer. With that, I want to introduce what you would call a frame of reference. So this is a coordinate system plus a time scale. In order to formulate the relative velocity along the line, let's put variables where A denotes the cyclist, P the passenger, and B the train. If point P is moving relative to reference frame A, we denote the velocity of P relative to frame A as V P P slash A X. If P is moving relative to frame B and frame B is moving relative to frame A, then the X velocity of P relative to frame A is just equal to the X velocity of P relative to B plus the X velocity of B relative to A. So to read this is just the velocity of P relative to A, the velocity of P relative to B, the velocity of B relative to A. So, and to specify the component further, the X velocity of P relative to A, the X velocity of P related to B, and the X velocity of B related to A. So here's an example of uh, relative velocity in one dimension. So you drive north on a straight line, a straight two lane road at a constant 88 kilometers per hour. A truck in the other lane approaches you at a constant of 104 kilometers per hour, as shown in this image. Find A, the truck's velocity relative to you, and B, your velocity relative to the truck. How do the relative velocities change after you and the truck pass each other? So treat this as a one-dimensional problem. So let's go back to our equation here. So x velocity of p relative to a. So p here is your truck t. And y here, uh, sorry, rather, the ur frame of reference y. So earth is e, OK? So the, the question is relative to you and okay so your frame of reference here is a and e and y so the equation will become uh, x velocity of the truck with respect to earth and then this is the x velocity yeah x velocity of the truck with respect to u, and this is the x velocity of u with respect to the earth. And you want to see the this, you want to get this. So you need to you need to rearrange this equation. So you will move this here. Oh, I think I did not fix this. It should be y. Okay, so remember the correction. Uh, should be the truck with respect to y, um, the x component. So that's how you get this. And then in order, your velocity relative to the truck. So it's just equal. So this is just a positive version of this. And then how do you how do the relative velocities change after you and the truck? 
So they don't change after you and the truck pass each other because, um, and also the relative positions do not matter, okay? Next. So now what if it's in two or three dimensions? So here we have a passenger walking from the side of the car to the other with a speed of one meters per second. We can then describe the position of the passenger using two frames of reference. So A for the stationary ground observer and B for the moving train. But instead of coordinates X, we use the position vector R because we are now dealing with a two dimensional problem. So from our knowledge of vector addition, we want to get the position of P relative to frame A. So we add the position vector for P relative to frame B and the position vector for B relative to A. So that will be our equation here. Position vector P relative to A, position vector P, um, uh, uh, position vector for P relative to B plus position vector of B relative to A. Now, in order to get the velocity, you will just need to take the time derivative of the equation to get a relationship among the various velocities. And that's how we got this relative velocity in space equation. Now, this equation here is known as the Galilean velocity transform transformation, and it relates the velocity of an object P with respect to frame A and its velocity with respect to frame B um, to the velocity of frame B with respect to frame A. So now let's have examples. So an airplane's compass indicates that it is headed due north and its airspeed indicator shows that it's moving through the air at 240 kilometers per hour. If there is a 100 kilometers per hour wind from west to east, what is the velocity of the airplane relative to earth? So we're given the velocity of the plane relative to A, we have it relative to a is given by 240 oh the air okay so this is relative Anyway, so going back, so we have the uh, velocity of the plane with respect to A and the velocity of the plane with respect to E. And we want the velocity of the plane with respect to the Earth. And we're given only A with respect to the Earth and P with respect to A. So we use the same equation. So we didn't really have to change much because, yeah, and then... That's how you get, so that's how you get this equation. And then in order to get the magnitude of that, we just need to get the um, sum, the square root of the sum of the squares of the components. And that's how you get this. To get the angle, so because you have the magnitude, you need the direction. So it's just arctan Vx over Vy, which is just V, the component of the velocity p with respect to a and the component of the velocity a with respect to e. So that's 23 degrees uh, 23 degrees east of north. Oh, sorry. Okay, we have another one here with wind and airspeed as in, as in example 3.14. In what direction should the pilot head to travel due north. What will be her velocity relative to Earth? Okay, same thing. We have, um, we were able to get, oh, sorry. So we used 240 and 100 kilometers. And then we're again missing the velo velocity of P with respect to the Earth. So the magnitude is still unknown. 
but we know it's its direction. And then, so to get the magnitude, it's the same. To get the angle, it's also the same. So you just need to get the two components, v, um, the velocity of P with respect to A. Oh, so the velocity of A with respect to E over the velocity of P with respect to A. So the, the variables have changed, but remember that this is still a um, vector analysis problem. So the, the same principles apply from what we've discussed in module two. So I hope that you can remember them and know why um, this we were able to answer it this way. Okay. So if you have further questions, feel free to message. That's it for module three. I'll stop recording.